In a world where high-performance zero-defect buildings are hard to find, two men are on a mission to disrupt the status quo. Welcome to the Enifis Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work perspective on the adjacent possible and challenges to the status quo. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I'm Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator here with my colleague, official agitator, friend and Yoda of most everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, Sir Yoda. Hello, Sir Yoda. And hello, everybody. Uh, Excited about today, I have to say. Yeah, today's guest has over 30 years of experience in uh, engineering buildings around the world. His fingerprints are on such projects as Apple's new headquarters in Cupertino, California, the Beijing Olympic Stadium, Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, and the City of Manchester Stadium in the UK, which, by the way, was built for the Commonwealth Games. He has experience in forensic engineering and structural assessment of damaged buildings and had worked on some of the bombings in the Manchester from 1996 and in Kenya in 1998. Welcome to the show, Mr. Steve Burrows. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. Steve, you received your Bachelor of Science with Honours in Civil Engineering from Liverpool Polytechnic. You became a Chartered Engineer in the UK and a Professional Engineer in California. You're a Fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers, a member of the Institution of Structural Engineers, and a Fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. You received the Brunel Medal, I think that was in 1994 or 84, one of those two, and you became a distinguished commander of the Order of the British Empire. That's kind of nice to have on a resume. Hey, Adam? <laughs> That's so right there. I am feeling uh, honored here. <laughs> among your public persona is a film production broadcasting on the science and National Geographic TV channels to promote engineering, which is absolutely awesome. Steve, students are going to be listening to this episode, and they want to know how they can become the Steve Burrows of the future. So tell us your story. The Steve Burrows of the future. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> so uh, so maybe, I, maybe I should tell you how I became an engineer, because uh, it's, sort of, it's, a, it's a short story, but it sort of shows how I stumbled into it. And so if I'm going to achieve anything by doing this podcast, maybe I could help people avoid to stumble and do it more deliberately. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened with me was, first of all, I left high school without graduating because I sort of lost my directions a little bit when I was in high school and found interest in motorcycles and other things of distraction. And so, uh, <laughs> well, let's come back to that, Steve, later on. <laughs> and, uh, and so what happened was uh, I actually, I was away on a motorcycle trip with some friends and my mom got me a job working at Unilever in the laboratories as a lab technician. And there I met a bunch of people who had PhDs in chemistry and physics. And one of them, Paul Kelso, took me under his wing and said, you know, you're a smart guy. You should go and get a degree. And they put me through night school for two years. Uh, I went a full day and a night. And I did what was called an ordinary national certificate at Carla Park College of Technology. And that, the only college degree that would accept me with that qualification was a polytechnic. And so I went to Liverpool Polytechnic because I couldn't go anywhere else um, with, with my qualifications. And I studied civil engineering because one of my friends at school studied civil engineering, and I thought I was smarter than him. And I thought, <laughs> if he can get a degree in civil engineering, I probably can too. And that was my logic. I knew zero about what a civil engineer did. No role models, no anything. I did it because I thought I could probably pass the exams. So that's uh, how to stumble into engineering. <laughs> You know, Adam, we've talked about this before on the show, you know, the the polytechnic route, which doesn't exist in the United States. It does exist in Canada. So yeah. for our listeners here, Steve, where are you calling in from today? I'm in, uh, I'm in Oakland, actually. I'm sitting outside a, a shop in Oakland where I've just had a meeting at 7.30 with a colleague of mine. 
and uh, and then uh, I decided to sit somewhere so you could see me on the video outside some butcher shop or something in Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so just for our listeners, so in ter- you know, in the world of um, engineering education in the UK and in Canada, there is a polytechnic route to achieve an education in engineering where that doesn't exist in the US, which is quite unfortunate, actually. It does does exist in the US. Oh, it does? Yeah. Who offers? So my eldest son went, I have two boys. Um, My eldest son went to Cal Poly, which is a polytechnic. And so this, the, the polytechnic, for the people who don't know, the distinction is that universities are mostly research establishments where they teach you theory. Yeah. And Polytechnic's mantra is learning by doing. Right. And so there's much more practical work. So I learned, and you know, what excited me about engineering was going to Liverpool Polytechnic. First of all, every lecturer was a practitioner. So they all had their own consultancies and they taught in the laboratory. So we would make stuff and break stuff. And, and I just loved breaking stuff and, uh, <laughs> and so it was like you know it's like it's just like you know the the idea to to really smash things that are big and strong and and then learn about them was fascinating for me it was just like a big you know toy room and uh, so i really really enjoyed that but but when i graduated and joined arab almost everybody else had gone to university and so i joined with 70 other graduates um maybe one or two of us went to polytechnics and it was sort of interesting to watch how it worked in the workplace because they were, you know, theoretically much stronger than me. But I had this sort of idea of, you know, if you're building a structure, what you're trying to determine is, you know, how would it, how would it fail and how do I avoid that? And I'd broken a lot of stuff. So I had a <laughs> idea. I, I knew how things failed. And so it was, I, you know, my approach was sort of engineering upside down and, you know, figuring out what could go wrong and yeah. how, do I, how do we avoid that? And so, you know, that's, that's with me today. That's still my approach to engineering is, you know, find the failure mechanism and avoid it. Yeah. I like um, that approach. So just to, just again, for the listeners' benefit, one thing I want you to take away is Steve did not graduate high school. So even if you bust out of high school, like I did, I left high school with two O-levels, which is basically a fail. And I went to university in my early 30s and did my bachelor's and master's. And I still wound up working at Arab, which is one of the prime consultants in the world, as is Steve. Now, I've not reached the heights of Steve, but do you know what? There is hope. Even if you bust out of school, there is a way in, right? (laughs) Do not give up. Yeah, There's always a way to redemption here. Yeah, and that's why – so I was asking about the polytechnic because – in Canada, if you graduate from a polytechnic, you're eligible for membership within the technical, the professional technical associations, but yeah. you're not licensed to practice professional engineering. The exception to that, and I know this because I graduated from a polytechnic school, building construction engineering, by the way, technology. I broke stuff too. In fact, my, <laughs> one of my very first jobs was working for a geotechnical engineering company, and I did concrete samples. So we'd get the cylinders back from the field, and I would yeah. cap them with the sulfur, and then I would crush them. And you're always waiting for that crush to happen. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's so. The only way for, for in my example, it was for me to practice professional engineering independently was that our technical associations and our professional engineering associations came to an agreement that for senior level technicians, you could write the professional examinations, declare your specialty, and if you passed, then you would could pr- practice professional engineering independent of the organization. So, or the, you know, the APEG, in our case, APEG, the Alberta Professional Engineering the Geologist Association. So, Adam, your point and Steve, you know, being able, you don't have this business about practicing engineering, being in the field of engineering doesn't necessarily have to come through the traditional routes. No, no, it uh, doesn't. But can I just can I just add something that really I, I think is yeah. really important? Mm. So, because when we talk about this, we say it's a very we describe this as three we're three white men talking about engineering, and we describe stuff in a very macho way, right? I mean, my, my story is about breaking stuff and, you know, that structure is a powerful thing. It's a very, ma- we're describing things in really masculine terms. But what I, what I did, you, you talked about some of my media work. So a couple of years ago, 
I was asked to make an IMAX movie called Dream Big, right. which is really targeted at getting girls into STEM subjects uh, to study STEM. Because one of the great myths about engineering is that it's it's a male profession with you know based on hard hats and big boots and and sort of you know and, and sort of macho culture. Yeah. I, I would say what I've learned, and and I'm lucky enough that. You know, one of the great things about being an engineer is you have to have continuous professional development. You have to learn something every year and prove that you've learned something every year yeah. is that it's actually a team sport. So it's not about you know, the reason that there is no, you know, star engineers that you can point to is that there isn't a project that isn't built done by a team. And, you know, it is about teamwork and not about sort of lone genius. And it's certainly not a male-only profession. There, today, you know, seven percent of the world's population work in construction, and and those people who work in construction know that the future is about creating a planet that is sustainable. And construction produces a huge amount of waste, and it also produces a huge amount of spaces that people live in. And the balance, the gender balance, is so vital to design, and is somewhat missing. That if anybody's going to take anything from this, I think there's more opportunities for women in engineering today than any here, here. time in history. Absolutely, here, here. That's a, that's yeah. That's well a great said. statement. Yeah, very well said. You know, and and the I mean, for Adam and I, we've had a number of female guests on not enough Adam like we were talking about this that we need to get more on and so for those listening if you know some individuals that, that uh, want to be interviewed for the show we'd love to have them on well one of the ones that comes to mind is Holly Chant from the United Arab Emirates we had her on and you know she made just some great statements that related to design you know be design in itself can be beautiful like the engineering yeah. process in itself can be beautiful it doesn't have to be an aesthetic thing like a building or the interior of a building but the actual mathematics the science itself can be beautiful i thought that was one of the most profound statements that we've ever had from a guest actually on the show and holly is a great example because she's broken through several glass ceilings that were put in front of her right she's yeah. existing in a very male oriented world in that part of the world and succeeding in a big yeah. way. So kudos for that. Yeah. Well, and one thing that one of the stories that has come through, I think with the women that we have interviewed is that that each of them have come through their own career path, not without challenges, but mm. overcoming those challenges has made them vital members of the team that you talk about, Steve, because yeah. they face challenges that men don't typically face. And um, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I think I think I think there's the sort of you know there's the sort of glass ceiling as you call it, or the stereotype engineer is seen as a male. But one of the big deals, you know, for me is that actually great design structures that are really great they flow. You know, they're, it's a very fluid thing. There's a view that structures are very you know rectilinear and brittle, but actually the best solutions, whether they're mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or structural engineering, is where things flow. And this idea of engineering inspired by nature, I, I have this sort of view of engineering that, that, you know, we try to create things that nature tries to destroy. So engineers have, for the whole history of the planet, been at war with nature. You know, they build something and then nature tries to, you know, blow it over or earthquake it down or, what, you know, <laughs> or whatever it might erode it. Yeah. And yeah. Actually, actually, I think we're coming to realize that designing in harmony with nature and it's called biomimicry, but this idea that design inspired by nature is the future of engineering. And, and I think that, that sort of, you know, that is something that I think is whether sort of uh, the female side of engineering is this idea of being much more at one with nature, which produces a better engineering design, is something that has been somewhat lacking. And, and it, you know, we're seeing much more in the, in the profession. So, you know, I don't think that you can have a balanced team without gender balance within it. And that, that is coming more and more important in the future of engineering. It's interesting to hear you say that because I'm, I'm actually a building fan. I'm not a frustrated architect because I'm a terrible drawer, but I see buildings as, a, as an art form, right? Yeah. For me, a building is an art form with form and structure, right? 
but also it has purpose. It it affects the community. It affects the pro the, the public realm. So they're really important things, and their lifespan is so huge, like fifty years on average, right? They really matter. Yep. So as yep. you say, uh, biomimicry, biophilic design is I I strongly agree with that is the future of design, and that has to have everybody's perspective, right? Particularly it, it does, female it does. perspective. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, so one thing, one of my personal frustrations, one of the reasons I blog every week is to stop my my head exploding at the <laughs> at the craziness that is our business. Right, there is there are all extremes in our business. There's the there's the inspirational, like lovely, beautiful buildings, and at the other end, there's just these donuts that are pumped out that are just horrific. Right, <laughs> and. Yep. The lack of innovation and the lack of change that stops the donut making drives me crazy. Now, I, I know you're involved with a firm that's, that's involved in modular and prefabricated construction. How, what are your feelings on that? Personally, I think it's a great thing. It, it enables greater quality control, more design input maybe. I don't know. But how, how does that work in the North American context? Yeah, well, I think um, you know what's, what's important to realize is that buildings are becoming less and less affordable. So there's a lot of data that shows that the cost of buildings has gone up greater than GDP for a long right. period of time. And there's also a lot of data that shows that the building industry is one of the least efficient industries in the world. So I, I saw, recently saw some data published by McKinsey that right. said that productivity on construction sites is around 57%. And that means that, that you know, Two, over two days a week for every person on the site is non-productive. Right? It doesn't go to delivering the product, adding value, and delivering the product. So, so the reason for you know the, for the the change in construction, there's a huge global shift which is aimed at increasing productivity. And so, you know, your logic that you described for offsite manufacturing for uh, buildings, for example is absolutely true. You know, the quality does improve. But the driver for this is to drive down cost because cities are becoming increasingly unaffordable and yet urbanization is taking place across the planet. And what is uh, there is a lack of labor in the market. In the United States of America, the average age of a carpenter is over 50 years of age. Yeah. And, and I, not that I'm ageist, I'm over 60 years of age. But that is showing that there aren't young people coming into the profession in the numbers that are required to build these buildings and therefore finding a way to automate the process of building buildings is absolutely essential to meet demand but also absolutely essential to make affordable buildings to allow in the United States of America it's very hard if not impossible to imagine how a teacher could live inside a city and that's there's something wrong with society when we can't have teachers and firemen and policemen living inside the cities that they serve and so my drive is to bring affordability back to the built environment and to drive the cost of these things down and my dream is to be able to build buildings at half the cost they are today at twice the speed and it's those sort of metrics that are essential to allowing cities to become affordable again. I like that a lot. So interestingly, where you're based on the West Coast or San Francisco, Oakland area, it's all, my daughter was there recently and her comment was, it's a bit like Elysium. There's the rich wafting around in their electric cars and then it's like a barbell. There's, there's that end of the extreme and the other end of the extreme, there's lots of homeless people and like defecation on the street, it's almost like a dystopia in a way. Is that how you're seeing it? You know, I mean, the, the social problems, that there's no doubt that, you know, I work in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, and there's no doubt that the social problems are significant. You know, the there are large numbers of, of homeless people sleeping on the streets. And, and you know, that's that's its own problem. That it is, you know, there, I don't really want to get into... Yeah. What I think, what I think, are the reasons behind that, because that's just my personal opinion. But what is absolutely true is that to build um, an apartment building in San Francisco today, it would cost somewhere in the region of eight hundred dollars a square foot. So if wow. you say that somebody somebody lives in seven hundred square feet, you know that's going to cost the developer, you know, pretty close to six hundred thousand dollars to create it. 
And if you think of a teacher's salary, you know, how is $600,000 affordable? And so it's this affordability issue that I want to try and address. You know, the, so the, you know, the, what you described as, you know, the, the, you know, the rich are getting richer and the, the poor are getting poorer. Yeah. I think there's a, bit, you know, there's a bigger issue around that. But the unaffordability of housing is striking. And so people are having to commute much longer distances. Two-hour commutes are not unusual now. And that, that can't go on. Um, you know, it's a, yeah. there's no quality of life for somebody who's having to commute two hours each way to work. Yeah. And, you know, how do they have a relationship with their children? You know, how do they, how do they relax? You know, how do they have a, a good life? And so we have to stop that. We have to reverse that and get things back to, to what we considered normal, which is that, you know, uh, workers get home at 6 p.m. at night and have dinner with their family. And, you know, those are the things that I think are important and I want to, to try and help resolve. I couldn't agree more with that. It's interesting. Yeah. The um, Yeah, God, I remember that vaguely, 6 o'clock home at night. That, was, that <laughs> happened to me a couple of times at least in the last 10 years. <laughs> but But you're right. Have you had any – so – when I was a, I'm also a chartered surveyor and I was a development manager for British Land for seven years before I moved to North America. And some of the projects we worked on, Arab projects actually, we used sort of offsite modular construction quite a bit, certainly on the toilet cores in residential and office buildings. But there's no real union activity in the UK. Is there any pushback on from unions in North America on prefab, offsite prefab? I think uh, so. You know that that's a very that's a very big question. Um, that you know, it would be very easy to answer yes or no to, but yeah. but the the answer is it depends. I mean, there is no doubt that somebody who's working on a construction site and is part of a union should expect to get paid prevailing wage, and you know it's important to do that. We have this issue of supply and demand. There aren't yeah. enough people. There aren't enough carpenters and plumbers yeah. and people who build these projects to allow the uh, uh, to meet the demand. And so the unions are mostly working with the offsite manufacturing companies to try and resolve that problem. You know, they have better working conditions in a factory than they do on a site. I mean, construction is second only to mining in the most dangerous industry in the world. Yeah. So, so, you know, we want people to be safe and to actually get home at night, you know, uh, without being harmed. And working at heights on a construction site is dangerous. And if we, the less we do that, the less labor that's doing that, the better. Um, and so the unions are generally working with the offsite manufacturers to come up with a compromise in which wages and working conditions and benefits are aligned such that it's a win-win for both parties. And that's not, you know, me in some sort mm. of, you know, wonderful fairy world that is really happening. And the best employers, the best offsite manufacturers work with the unions to come to a compromise. And the unions are helping. You know, there there is no union war against offsite manufacturing of buildings. Right. It's really a case of having a grown up conversation and coming to an agreement and making it work for the benefit of both parties. So so I'm very hopeful about that. But what it also does is it makes us think about buildings differently because right now when you build a building, you do it's sort of uh, you know when you describe it to somebody they think you're crazy. Um, you know, because currently, you, de- you know, we design a building, then we break it up into 20 different parts. You know, we call <laughs> them, uh, you know, foundations, structure, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, sprinklers. Yeah. So, you know, we break it up into these different parts, send it out to a whole bunch of subcontractors who price each of those parts. And then we try and connect it all back together and build it. And what off-site manufacturing is doing is it's making us think about buildings much more like Lego and yep. saying, how can you create buildings that connect together really easily and don't have to be broken apart? They're very, buildings are very complex. These components can be coordinated. And so it's making us think about it much more and finding ways in which we can, we can do things that don't have to be broken into pieces to be built. And, and I really like that because my whole history, the reason I joined Arup in the first place, honestly, was because Ove Arup, who founded the firm, was actually a contractor. He was a builder who, who went into consulting because he said, 
these consultants don't know how to build anything. They produce <laughs> designs that are really, <laughs> really hard to build. Now, I wasn't there. I'm, I'm like, he never told me this, but it was like my perception of his thinking. Yeah. And I thought, I thought, I agree with that. You know, I want to, I, when I design something, I want to know how is it going to be built? Yeah. And, and that sort of got lost in our industry for a long period of time. And offsite manufacturing is bringing it back. So I keep saying to people, you know, it's sort of like back to the future because I look at the Egyptians building the Great Pyramid and it's genius. And those guys had to know how they were going to build it when they made it, when they designed it and made it. And that was 6,000 years ago. And then we've sort of lost that. And now we're rediscovering yeah. that skill. And it's super exciting because uh, we're doing it in a modern context. So my, uh, you know, honestly, my, my biggest fear for the future is that uh, I'm going to be too old to see the change in engineering happen because of my career will end, you know, and I don't want it to ever end. I mean, I love being an engineer and I want to do it forever. But unfortunately, I'm at the wrong end of it. Oh, I don't know. I think there's I, I, demographics going to go in your favor here. And I th- is one thing. <laughs> and two, I think the change is going to be exponential. It's going to be, what did Ernest Hemingway say about going broke? You go broke slowly at first, then you go broke very fast. And I think the change in construction will be the same. It will start slowly, but it will exponentially change. It will absolutely go faster as because so, so many baby boomers are retiring, something like 10,000 a day in the U.S., a retirement. Yeah. How many uh, carpenters, tradesmen, pipe fitters, you know, design engineers in that? A lot, right? Yeah. Now they're going to work part time probably because it's going to be available to them. But ultimately, that pressure, I think, is going to be the pressure that's going to move change to the exponential in our business. Yeah. yeah, actually, just you know, you've just made me think of something else that's that's a, a trend that's happening in engineering. So you know, first of all. The, the people are writing algorithms. We see most in most engineering firms, they employ script writers now. So yeah. there's a lot of people who, you know, have computer science qualifications coming into engineering because a, a lot of what we have traditionally done by hand can be done by an algorithm. Yes. And so that's a change that's, that's happening everywhere. And the other big change that we see is the movement towards robotics on construction sites and automation actually on the site. You know, I've seen robots that build brick walls. I've seen robots that finish drywall. I've seen robots, you know, you can have cranes. There's no need for a man to be sitting at the top of a crane. It's not safe and it can be done more efficiently using an algorithm. So there are a number of trends. We're seeing people coming into the construction industry who are biologists, who have, you know, come from different backgrounds. And I, I think the traditional route into engineering is no longer essential. It used to be, you know, it was math, physics, chemistry, you know, yeah. engineering degree, qualification. But actually, I think that engineering is much more welcoming of a whole range of skills as it goes through this change that you described. And, you know, right now, if you've got a computer science degree and you want to create a legacy that your great, great grandchildren will say, you know, my grandma was involved in creating that. Engineering is the place to do that. And it's so exciting and a time of great change. Listen, you have got to go yeah. to NYU. They suck <laughs> at inspiring their students. You've got to go there and give a rah-rah speech, right? Because my rah-rah speech would send them into progression because I'm a bit of a like, come on, do it. I get inspired by the embracing the suck. But what you just <laughs> described, right, is in, yeah. you set, the reason out why they should go into the built environment. It is such a opportunity for anyone to come in, right, with some adjacent thinking and make a change. Yeah, I'm, I'm working with a company at the moment. They design schools, right? Right. K through twelve, K through twelve schools, and you know we talk about design and you know offsite manufacturing of of the schools. And I had to say to them, "What is it like on the day a school opens? What's it like?" And they said, "Oh, it's unbelievable. There's these children." They're super excited. They're running around looking at the school because you've created something for the, from a blank sheet of paper. You've created something that for 50 years, people are going to get their education there and you've, you're going to inspire them through your design and what you've done. You're going to create Absolutely. the learning environment for the next 50 years. Yeah, That's what we got to remember. We're not making a piece of structure. We're creating a legacy that is going to go on for 100 years. That education that they got in the place we created is going to live with thousands of people for a hundred years. 
keep that in mind and yeah. then design it and see what you come up with. And it'll be much better. And that's what we got to remember. We affect people's lives for a hundred years, not just the life of the building. Mm -hmm. I can remember the building I went to college in and how it, well, how, what it meant to me. Yeah. And I'm sure you can remember your first oh, house. I do. Yeah, or your, yeah. What, yeah. It's, these things are emotional things that impact us for the rest of our lives. And you've got to keep that in mind. That's why an engineering is great. And you go work in a bank, try and get that inspiration out of your work. Come and join engineering. <laughs> Come join engineering and you can't, you know, it, like you'll, you know, you change the world. Yeah. yeah. I could not agree more with that. You said that so well. We should, I should beam that to every bloody university. I, universities are terrible at getting students excited about the workplace because they're so focused on sort of like, I don't know, teaching them, I guess, right? For me, there's not enough focus on like, when you're coming out of this process, guys, you know, there's a big world out there. There's all these opportunities and no one really comes in and talks to them about that in my experience. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do anything? You can do yeah. anything. I mean, you know, just from my career, yeah. you know, I've worked in, I've worked in Hong Kong, China, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, the Ukraine, you know, four times in the United States. You can travel the world yeah. and you do amazing things. Yeah. And I don't know any job. Yeah, I, I, I you know, and I say to people, what? Is there a more exciting job than engineering? And I describe, you know, my career and go, you know, if your your career is more exciting than that, then I want to hear about it because I've not met anybody yet. <laughs> yeah, it's had, like you know, it's been a, like such an amazing life that I've yeah. had from engineering. Yeah, um, I've not met anybody. I, you, you know, maybe you'll find somebody. You know, you say Elon Musk. Yeah, I've got a more exciting life than Elon Musk. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, oh. I mean, electric vehicles, well, like, you know. Put this into perspective. I So <laughs> I, I I started doing, my career started about 30 years ago. And on average, I do 10 trips a year around the world, right? Yep. Most of it in North America, but also into Europe. So 10 trips, 30 years, that's 300 trips that yep. I have been on. Who can, I mean, Adam, you can say that. Steve, you can say that. But not many people can say that at the, and I'm 57, that I've been to 300 places, you know, or some of them, of course, have been duplicates. But you, the travel is incredible. And in the travel, you get to see other forms of experiences because that's what yeah. engineers do. We, yeah. You know, people think we engineer buildings and whatnot, but what we're actually doing is we're engineering experiences. When people are in a building, that's an experience. And it, you get, yeah, go ahead. It is, it is. But no, you're absolutely right. But what for me, what's even more important than that is because it's team game, you work with people who come from a different culture, who've got a different approach. Yeah, and totally. They, they, they change you, right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you work, at, if you're going to work in, in China, I mean, I worked with some Chinese engineers and they built in the Olympic Stadium for China, which meant so much to them. And I saw that sort of pride in building something for the nation that really, you know, really affected me. And I want to be proud about my heritage i want to be proud about every job i do the same in the ukraine you know at the same in same in italy and so you they change you and it's not just the experience of visiting because you're working in a team in their culture yeah. you're changed too and i think you become a better human being honestly and so you know i like to think that engineering has made me a better person than you know than i was when i Dropped out of high school and uh, <laughs> I screwed my life up. Well, and I don't know about you, I don't know about you two guys, but I do know that having the experience of traveling and, like you said, Steve, they they do change you. Going home after, and this happens after every trip that I come home from, is that I have I get a sense of gratitude. Yeah, for the for the opportunity that I had, a to travel to other cultures to see what is happening, but also to be influenced by these other worlds, these other mindsets. And there, I, I don't know of a better way to, to feel gratitude than to expose yourself to these other things and then come back and look at your own world. It's it's incredible to have that. It feeling. is incredible, but uh, but equally, I you know I look at my friendships around the world. Mm. And think, you know, you know how, how I wouldn't have had that. I'm in touch with people in all these countries. I'm in touch with them on a regular basis because, you know, working together on a on a project builds friendships that last forever. And and I'm and I'm really proud of that. Wherever I go in the world, I've got a friend, and yep. you know, and, and a genuine friend. We've been through something together. <laughs> we created something together. 
you know, not just somebody who an acquaintance. You know, these these you know, engineering be, builds deep bonds of friendship. When you do a project together, you've been through an experience yeah. like no other. Uh, mm -hmm. Creating something, it's not easy. But when you get through the other side of it, you know, there's a bond of friendship that just lasts a lifetime. And yeah, you know, again, I don't know how else you could do that other than through, through what we do. Yeah, I, I agree. So one one uh, management people I read, he said, the way you create great teams is you put people together and get them to do extraordinarily difficult stuff. Yeah. And they come out of that the other end as friends, right? Yeah. Because is the, that... The, the, yeah, the great news about this is that, yeah. you know, what I re what, what's great about engineering, why it's special is, you know, a few things are going in our favor. Because, um, like, gravity is the same everywhere. So it sort of helps, you know. The, the, um, and it's the free. If you're, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and air is the same. Air is the same everywhere. You know, it flows in exactly the same way. And electrons flow the same everywhere. Yeah. And so all these things allow you to be an engineer. It's a global profession because, luckily, it's the same everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, there's a few rules that are a bit different. But broadly, you can practice anywhere in the world. So you can choose where you go. I live in California. But I, you know, I'm English and I've worked all over the world. But because those things go in my favor, you know, I can, as you know, if gravity changes, I'm in trouble. But, but you know, I don't plan seeing that anytime soon. The Edifice Complex will continue in just a moment. If you're enjoying this podcast, we need your help. We're not asking for money, just a minute of your time. Our goal is to make the Edifice Complex podcast as relevant, educational, and useful as possible. By having good ratings, we can reach the widest audience. Therefore, our request is two small things. If you haven't already, leave us a review and rating on iTunes. And subscribe to the Edifice Complex on YouTube, even if you normally only listen to the audio version. These two things will help us immensely. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. Thanks for your time. And now, back to the show. You've got some hefty things going on here, like changing construction to be half the cost and twice as fast. Can you add yep. into that, converting as an Anglo-American, converting them to metric, please? <laughs> Some some things are just impossible, and, <laughs> and I, I just say, I even say when, when we you know, the, the, I have this saying that, that every now and again, you know, you get to a point where it just, it, you know, it's just too much at this point in time, and I I, I I say, you know, let's not push against the locked door, and you know, some of those things are, you know, not right now. Let's wait until the door's unlocked, and then let's push against it, and it will work. Uh, so, I, you know, I try not to push against locked doors. I do a lot of work with the US Corps of Engineers overseas, and they, they've gone metric because they've just had to, because every time they exported designs over an Imperial, the local market couldn't source it, and it just created all sorts of confusion. So they're done, right? So it's all, the door's open, as far as I'm concerned. It's I, just, it I'll tell you what I love. Yeah, the, the, I, was, I, was with, uh, I was with a guy the other day, and we were talking about, we went to see uh, the Disney, it was actually yesterday or the day before, we were at the Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, which is a right. Frank Gehry project. Yeah, and I showed him the, the if you've ever seen it, Frank Gehry did um, an episode of The Simpsons. It's only a two oh, minute, two I minute clip, but it's, right. it's you should look at it. It's fantastic. But as part of it, Marge Simpson uh, says to Frank Gehry, "Please build a project for us in Springfield," and she says. Because we were the first American city to abandon the metric system, that's her, that's her line, which I just, I, it just cracks me up, you know. That, uh, yeah, that is hilarious. Okay, just before we get on, I want to be respectful of your time, but we have some questions we normally ask all guests at the end, some rapid fire ones. Sure. But before we do sure. that, you're a very forward-looking person, which is one of the reasons we're speaking to you. What's your take on? I hate this saying, the Internet of Things, but the digitization of building performance monitoring. Have you, have you see, are you seeing the needle move on that where you are? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of data that says that if a building costs one unit to actually create, it then costs five more units to operate throughout its life. So in terms of cost. And, right. and we don't really monitor the performance of buildings in terms of, you know, the impact on the people who use them. So there are many things that we can measure 
like you know volatile organic compounds and indoor air quality and and we can do things to make it better healthier workplaces so i do see a lot of work being put into the internet of things in terms of ongoing building monitoring for the health of the occupants so that that's one area another big area of interest for me is that buildings if buildings could respond to their environment so you know this at home when the sun shines on the window it gets very hot inside the the room um if the blind was outside the building and just came down and shaded the room from that gain you would need to use much less energy to yeah. maintain the temperature in the space so i see a lot of work on buildings responding to their environment and being much more organic in that way there's some cool designs where you know i've seen several things one is people put they grow trees outside the building and the trees are in leaf in the summer and they're not in leaf in the winter and yeah. that allows the you know the trees to moderate the temperatures inside the building which is really cool but also building facades electrochromic glass buildings that where they you know a bit like your polaroid sunglasses the glass changes to yeah. to suit the environment so i think that for me the internet of things are going to is creates the opportunity for buildings to be much more dynamic and organic and opens up all sorts of design possibilities alongside it and that's what really excites me about it i also have this idea that you know right now you enter a building by using a key which was invented about right. 400 years ago and uh, <laughs> and yet yet many modern cars when you approach the car the vehicle unlocks itself when you leave uh. it locks itself you know you currently set your house alarm by pressing four digits in a keypad and yet the building will know when you're present and when you're approaching and it, and the interface the interaction between humans and their and their spaces will become much more dynamic too so those are the internet of things those are the things that excite me right. about that and i see it happening all the time and i i give you one example i'm working with a company in san francisco and they've created a a plug-in accelerometer so what this is i know that that sounds a bit technical but basically it measures movement you plug it in the wall it measures the movement of the building now what it does is every building has a movement buildings are moving all the time sure. it creates a movement fingerprint and if there was right. then an earthquake you could check the fingerprints of the building after the earthquake compared to before and determine whether the building was safe to reoccupy and you know that is so it's so cheap to do and yet it would save a lot of lives you know that that you see a lot of problems yeah. after shocks cause buildings to collapse after an event and you could check that without anybody being in the, in the building so i think technology is coming to the construction industry and is going to revolutionize how things are done I hope so. I agree with that. I think the key factor here is going to be the falling cost of technology, right? Yes. Yeah, when you can start putting these sensors around there for for 50 cents, 25 cents or a dollar a time, that's when it's going to absolutely explode. Completely, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. There there was Absolutely. a there okay. was a there was a uh, professor Chris Peister was his name and this is going back now 15 17 years ago and he was looking at nanotechnologies these little nano sensors and one of the uh, application was is that these sensors could get so small that you could put them in paint and you would yeah. paint the room with and so the room surfaces became the sensor and through technology you would you know people could wear sensors so the building could actually know who was in the building where they were and what was needed to adjust the environmental conditions for that person now think about that in terms of healthcare right you know hospitals yeah, that yeah. are built for people who would say have alzheimers or other physical and psychological challenges the building could actually then enable them to exist at a with much more comfort than today's buildings yeah and what what is interesting is you know if you talk about environment environmental conditions inside buildings you know people are different so you know if you're if all three of us were in the same space you know one of us might be too hot and one of us might be too cold and so a lot of this technology is allowing you to you know personally change your your space yeah. so that you're comfortable and you know because right now i don't make it you know mechanical engineers who design you know temperatures inside spaces have this measure it's called ppd yeah perfect uh, yeah. the, the percentage of people who are dissatisfied and i often think well that's a you know that's really bad isn't it you're actually designing some people to be unhappy 
and we want to try and make yeah. it good for everybody. So I, I think technology will allow that to happen much more easily. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, on that whole subject, so I sit on the uh, committee that writes the standard for uh, thermal comfort, and PPD, okay. you know, PPD is is a big part of it, and and so yeah, we we say okay, well, if we're successful with the architecture, the interior design, the mechanical systems that we expect, you know, 80 to 80 to 90 percent of the people would be happy. But that also implies that 10 percent of the people will be unhappy for those yep. 10 for those 10 percent. There is 100 percent failure. Yeah. 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 Right. And so we yep. have to look at it, not not from, you know, and those 10 percent, of course, are unproductive. They're the ones that are getting sick. They're the ones that are taking leave of absence, uh, you know, or present, they call it presenteeism, where they're there, but, but they're not, you know? Presenteeism. Presenteeism. So we, have, <laughs> we, have, we have absenteeism, right, where they're away from the building because they're sick. Yeah. When they come to work and they're sick, they're still not productive. So presenteeism. Meant, but America yeah. is really good at inventing words. I'd never heard of deplaning until I came to the United <laughs> yeah, States. Yeah. So now I've got a new one. Oh. Present is I'm problematizing. <laughs> but the problem is, the, the, the in that ten percent could be some of your most productive, valuable workers. That's the point that's often missed right. here, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a there's a value to that. Anyway, yeah. I want to respect Steve's time. Yeah. So Steve, we're just going to move on. We're going to wrap up soon, but we're just going to do some rapid fire questions. There's no wrong answer, but there's no phone a friend. So <laughs> okay. My question to you is. Again, this sounds like a subject dear to your heart as well as mine. What advice would you give to a young woman graduating with an engineering degree going into built environment? I'd say to her that this is the greatest time in history to be an engineer and the profession absolutely needs you. At, well said, moment, man. Very well said. I don't think there's anything to add to that. That's a mic drop moment there, actually. <laughs> <I think. laughs> yeah, very good. I believe it. I believe it wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. No, I know you do. Steve, we have a whole bunch of architectural students that are going to be graduated in the next couple of years, going to go out and start their careers. There's a lot of good buildings and a lot of bad buildings. What advice do you have for these architectural students so that, that their career is uh, populated with good buildings and not bad buildings? I think uh, the best advice I ever had was by, uh, he's a developer in London. I don't know if you'll actually hear this, but a guy called Jeff Taylor. And he said, you know, you've always got to, imagine the world by looking at it through somebody else's eyes. And so I'd say for an architectural student, you know, understand how construction is done, understand how difficult it is to build things, understand things from other engineers' perspectives. And when you do that, you'll produce better buildings. And don't try and do it by yourself. And I say the architects I've worked with who have, you know, generally failed to produce good buildings have thought that they were some sort of lone genius. And I, there is no lone genius in this in the, in creating buildings. Well said, absolutely well said. Well said. Yeah, that's so. I think that's. I think we should stop it right there because there's a couple of mic drops. <laughs> I don't know about you, Adam, but I mean, I could talk to Steve. You know, yeah, forever. You, Steve, stay right there. Adam and I are gonna go get on a plane. We're gonna come visit you. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting cold here. Actually, so I'm not. I'm, <laughs> All right. Yeah. So listen, Steve, thank you so much. I know we, we nearly had you on earlier. And I'm so glad we got you on in the end because inspirational, very inspirational. Thank I you. hope I see when we do this podcast, I have in my mind someone who's sort of like in their last year of university thinking, what do I do? And maybe they will listen to this and get a bit of inspiration and go in a good direction. That's that's what I want for this podcast. I hope so too. So thank yeah. you. Thanks yeah. for having me. I enjoyed it. No. Great stuff. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll let you know when we're going to drop the podcast. Okay. Perfect. No problem. Thanks. Do, do, Thank you very much. As a much. commander, do we salute you when we say goodbye or what do we do? We <laughs> always, always, always. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good job. Good job, guys. <laughs> Thank See, you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, I found that a very inspirational podcast. It made me want to be a student and start all over again, actually. <laughs> no kidding. I... <laughs> You know, I well, I can say this now that you know when we retire from our careers, and ultimately the podcast will have run its course. We'll look back on that one particular podcast with Steve as being one of the more inspirational. 
We've had a lot yeah. of inspirational people on it. You know, not to take away from those all those other ones because they're all awesome. But Steve brought a different angle to it, and uh, obviously, we're very grateful to have his time. So thanks, uh, thanks, Steve. If you're listening to the podcast, we really appreciate your uh, the time you gave us. So there's some takeaways there that I think are so universal, right? One, if you flunk out and make a mistake, there's still a way back in, right? Yeah. He did not graduate high school, and he's fast forward to his late 50s, early 60s. He's a very highly decorated engineer with a recognition as a CBE, and he's out there trying to make a difference, right? And also, even like, most people at the end of their careers, they, they slow down. He's still got a dream of halving building costs and making it twice as fast. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. Most people are thinking about their retirement condo. He's still out there, you know, with fire in his belly, right? There is a role model and a half, if you ask well, me. Well, you said that there are the fire in the belly. I mean, when you, when you, yeah. when you were interviewing the, uh, Steve, of course, we have a visual. Uh, communication with him as well and yeah it's like he's got this chip in his in his uh, chest that glows right you know he's just got a passion for what he does and how could you not love that yeah Yeah. i like i like the fact he came through so the uk i didn't realize it was like this it's like this to some degree in the states and canada but in the uk they're the vocational route I find tends to produce the best engineers. And I'm not saying that because that's the way I went through. Yeah. But there's a route like where you go to night school, but you're working in the day. So, you know, it's tough luck, suck it up. You've got to go to night school and work. But the result of that is when you come out of your college education, you've got the experience to go along with right. it. And when you get something in college that's going on, you don't understand, you can walk in the office the next day and find someone who can break that down for you yeah. and show you in real, I'm a visual learner. So that really worked for me. Right. Right. Yeah. Whereas the theory, like I was, I loved applied maths, but pure math drove me nuts because it's it's just so intangible, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so the vo- again, it's probably because of my bias is like this, but vocational people who came up from the vocational route, they still wind up being child engineers and professional engineers, but they just have that can-do practicality, right? The hands-on is the way I describe it. They're kinesthetic yeah. in how they approach things. Yeah. You know, that is actually a bit of a difference maker, I believe. Now I've getting older and looking back uh without a doubt i mean we've talked about this before and some of the conclusions that like when we were hiring engineers out of university for our our uh, business we wanted to know what did you do during summer breaks were you on yes. the tools or you actually on the job site working the tools those guys that had field experience you know that we're willing to say you know okay i'm gonna i'm i've got this academic capability i got a good mind for the math and the sciences but they ended up working at walmart (laughs) sears the bay or whatever right but the guys are actually that said you know what i'm gonna go if i'm gonna be a civil engineer i'm gonna go learn about concrete where i learn about concrete i go learn about concrete by being on a crew i'm gonna wheel concrete i'm gonna pick up a wheelbarrow for two months of my life break my back but understand what concrete is, you know, and it, and then so, anyways, yeah, the field experience for the engineers priceless. He made some really good statements. I know you wrote it down. I wrote them down. One of the ones that I thought was really good was engineering is at war with nature, or has been in the past at war with nature. Nature always yeah. wins. So let's always. So that's <laughs> that's learn with that. And then so we went on to the discussion about you know biomimicry, and we of course have had a guest on who specialized that. What did you think about yeah. that statement? Nature always wins. Uh, Engineering in the past has been at war, and uh, we, we need to change. All right. So when I was a partner at Cobalt Engineering, that was our thing. You know, we've got to learn. So we were big proponents of sustainable design, and we were big proponents of radiant systems, which in North America is like selling rabies, right? <laughs> <laughs> no one wants it. Yeah. But what we were saying there is, you know, let's obey the laws of physics, maybe, right, which is nature. So, you know, hot air rises. It doesn't fall out of high-level supply grills. <laughs> 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 and cold air dumps. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, just the basics of physics, you know, let's not fight nature. Let's just go along with it. Yeah. You know, this is why displacement ventilation works. Someone said to me, oh, that new technology is never going to work. And I always put up a picture of the wind towers in Dubai and Iran. So, well, those were built over a 1,000 years ago. What did they know? So that was goes to yeah. his point, right? You know, back to the future. The Egyptians knew how to design and build. Yeah. Design and build today is a contractual form, but actually design and build as a concept is a way, way deeper concept. Right? Yeah. I, right? yeah. As you know, I just came back from Italy and uh, I spent a good part of my time over there 
looking at the old ancient architecture. Mm. Or the rubble. The, yeah, well, so that's right. Exactly. So my dad's, <laughs> a, as for those that are listening, my dad's a chartered accountant and he was over in Italy a few years ago and he came back and of course his eyes are looking at the old Roman ruins and I said to him, so, so what do you think of the old Roman ruins? He goes, oh yeah, that rubble. <laughs> you know, I look at it from a completely different perspective and, I, and I'm, at, I'm amazed at the architecture and the engineering that went into those buildings and here we are thousands of years later and, and the remains of those buildings still stand you know yeah now to what i talk about you want to talk about a design build concept right that yeah. that was all design build you know some of it was done under brutal <laughs> dictatorships but <laughs> but granted we're going back that way slowly <laughs> <laughs> but you know they, were, they did some good stuff so and and going back to nature wins well if you look at the ruins around the world it doesn't have to be you know in the old ancient roman or greek but you go to china you go to anywhere in asia india you know the middle east nature wins well this is uh, going on to his thing that uh, biomimicry and biophilic design is going to come back because that speaks to nature winning in terms of a uh, right climate erosion on your cladding and, you know, resilient buildings to, to deal with that, right? And how you can be more integrated with nature rather than fight it. Yeah. Right? So that goes to more natural ventilation solutions and more, you know, there's there's a whole raft of solutions that aren't run of the mill but are available that I think are going to come back into buildings, right? Yeah. He said another thing that I want to get your perspective on because there's a big message in here and he said – in terms of productivity, the construction industry runs around 57%. In other words, for every two days of construction, only one of them actually goes towards building the building. The other day is wasted in moving stuff, going back and forth to the jobs. You know, like this is just a lot of waste. Yeah, so my perspective on that is so I do a lot of work in the Middle East and in, uh, in other countries where labor is so cheap, right? So in some countries, labor can be as little as a dollar or two dollars a day, right? So you're never going to automate that workforce, right? But the mm -hmm. productivity of that workforce is probably way less than 57%. So one of the few upsides of expensive labor is it forces you into innovation and automation, right? So that's why our country like America is at the bleeding edge of that because labor is expensive and now becoming very, very scarce due to all the tradesmen and the senior engineers and technologists all retiring. 10,000 yeah. people a day retire in the US. Yeah. That demographic is exactly the same as the UK, uh, Canada, you know, the places the we're familiar with. Really. Yeah, developed world. So yeah. this, whether you want this change or not, it's coming because literally the people are evaporating out the business. Yeah. You know, we, you know, I've talked about this before and again, there is a segment of the industry that's willing to die on its own sword to protect its ability to do stuff the way it was done in the past. And I, you know, and if we had Steve back on again, I would like to ask him this because I think, it, I, I think the stats and you could, I'll have to get corrected on this. I admit this, these, this is just coming back from my memory, but over 60% of the buildings in North America are under 10,000 square feet, which means that most of those buildings were fabricated by small firms. And, in the world of mechanical, you know, those are companies that you know, have four employees or less. Yeah. They have, typically, the owner has no transition plan in place. And there's a difference between the two business owners. One who is who is the businessman that owns the mechanical contracting business, and the other one is the tradesman that owns the mechanical contracting business. And their sense of security comes from, in the case of the businessman, his share value. Because he's going to sell that asset at some point in time. The tradesman that owns the trades business, his sense of security comes from the ability to do the work. Yeah. One has a job, and, one has a business, right? Right. And what we find is that the tradesman that owns the business looks at prefabrication as a threat. He sees that whole world as that's my Ballywick. That's my job. Be you know, I can do that and you're doing it in a factory. Therefore, you're taking my livelihood away and they will die on their own sword to defend that. But you know what? So here's the reality to that. Yeah. They can die on that hill. Go ahead. Knock yourself out is my message to them because this is yeah. what's happening, right? The transition from horse to car took 10 years because the lifespan of a horse is eight to 10 years, right? Yeah. All right, so the transition to better buildings is longer because the lifespan of building is 50 years. 
However, we are at the back end of that 50 years because right. that 50 years was built on a baby boomer workforce that is now retiring and evaporating. And there is just nowhere near the people coming in behind. Yeah. So this change, you can die on that hill and knock yourself out. We'll wave at you as you go. But this yeah. change is coming. So you uh, so you made a statement about North American radiant system. So this mm. is this message for those that are in the mechanical world, in the hydronic, mm. uh, the hot water heating, but specifically that deals with radiant, is that there's so much custom work out there. Yeah. Every time a system gets done, because there's no prefabrication, there's no standard, right? Yeah. So the custom work gets installed into someone's home, and because of demographics – the person who designed and built that system, it's a one-off. They leave the industry and they leave behind all of this custom work. Who gets left with the product, of course, is the owner of the building. Now the owner owns a one-off custom-made piece of work. And when that thing needs repair work or servicing or whatever, it's a, basically a crapshoot for the next guy to come onto the job site to try to figure it out. And because of that process, I have made the statement that until the that industry starts to standardize, it will see itself commit Harry Carey. Yeah, it will. Um, prefab, as you, so that was an interesting stat you, you rolled out just a minute ago, was 60% of buildings are under 10,000 square foot. So anything under 10,000 square foot, all right, let's cut it in half, 5,000 square foot. Could be prefabricated yeah. and dropped in place, right? Right. That's the future. Yeah. And that, as Steve said, that provides better working conditions, better outcomes, better yeah. outcomes for people that work there, right? Yeah. You know, I, I remember getting up at five in the morning to be on site at seven, freezing my what's itself all day, you know, where, you know, you could be doing that in a controlled environment. <laughs> Well, yeah, why you know, exactly? Why wouldn't you? So there are, so if you think about under 5,000 square feet, so now you're moving into small commercial space, small industrial yeah. buildings, but also then the housing market as well, right? And there are companies that, uh, you know, that have got jumped into that world, prefabricated housing. Amazon being one of them, so. Um, yeah, right. Amazon so, are in housing now. Yeah, I you know I this whole prefab as you know my history we had a prefabricated uh, mechanical company where we were making substations yeah. and and you know perhaps we were ahead of our time. I've left the industry that part of the business behind. The production of that those systems continue on with another another firm. But there's no doubt in my mind that the world of prefab is is coming into its own. And if you can fight it, you know for those that are listening, you can fight that all you want. As Adam says, you're going to die on the hill. Yeah. Those of us that have, that have no hair or gray hair will observe that death. We'll have said, we told you so. Yeah. And we will <laughs> feel, happening. feel justified yeah. in, our, <laughs> in our shame and mocking of you. And our shame. But we'll also shed a tear because yeah. we hate to see those industries that have employed thousands and thousands of people. People have, you know, raised families on that process yeah, and, you know, put kids through schools and whatnot, but it, things change and you can't, you're not going to stop that. Yeah. All right. So listen, I need to wrap up, but I want to wrap it up on the thought. He said, his life is more exciting than Elon Musk. And I must say, I have to agree with that. Yeah. It's good to be in the field. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. See you next time.